In this lecture, we're going to finish off the week one topic of an introduction to accounting theories. So in the live webinar, we would have went through and looked at, well, what, why are we even looking at accounting theories in AF2? Why might they be important? And uh, what might an accounting theory cover? Right? And I suppose this, the different accounting theories can often be developed for two particular functions. One is to describe what's actually happening. So why, a, why are, for example, inventory accounted for in that way? What is the practice around provisions? Right, so describe the practice or to prescribe. So there's two important definition words there. Prescribe says how it should be done. So for example, you could have an accounting theory that says this is the way assets should be valued. Not that the way they are being valued, but what should be done in practice. So it's important that we can critically evaluate the theories before accepting them. Now critically evaluate means you question them. You question well, what assumptions are they based on? Do you agree with that logic? Is there any evidence for that theory? And that's an important thing to underline, even as a graduate, is to be critical or to critically evaluate things that are going. Don't just accept, oh, this is the way it has always been done, but question why and understand where it came from. Right? So accounting theories itself, what, what is it? Well, it's, it's logical reasoning in the set of a broad principles, a form a set of broad principles. They give a generic or general framework for accounting practice and they guide development of new practices. And that's quite uh, overall in general. You're not going to be asked to recite a definition. But the point is, it's a general framework or reference. So if we're looking at the framework reference is saying, well, how should income be measured? Or how should assets be measured? We look at the theories around the purpose of accounting. Or if we're trying to guide the development of new standards. For example, IFRS 17 now is the newest standard to do insurance. We're trying to go, well, what are the guiding principles we should look at when we're coming up with new accounting standards? And you're going back to what theories are there. So for example, we can have theories that prescribe how assets should be valued. So remember, historical cost accounting, that's a theory. It's a theory that says assets should be valued at their historical cost. You could also have an accounting theory, a separate one, that predicts why managers will choose particular accounting methods. So can we predict whether one manager uses historical cost to value their non-current assets or whether another manager uh, uses the revaluation model? We can explain how someone's cultural background might affect the accounting information they provide or what type of accounting information should be available to stakeholders or predict that the relative power of a stakeholder group will affect the accounting information. So for example, what we might predict there is if you're, for example, a very strong environmental stakeholder group, then that company is going to release a lot more environmental information than a company without that powerful stakeholder group. So again, some of them can be logical, but they can be useful to understand why things are happening in practice, right? So understanding that um, accounting theory. Right? So to understand where accounting theory has come from, like the, before the 1920s, and this is a short history lesson, there was no real accounting theory. Right? No one was really asking why or what is happening. It was really just practical focus. It was your bookkeeping, your debits and credits, but there was no higher arching or kind of critical thinking around, well, are these the best practices? Right? So no theory was really developed. But after, into the 1920s, and we had the, the Wall Street crash and the, the use of accounting information, there was, the, there was a more scientific approach uh, for that next period of 40 to 50 years. And it was what we call, this is important, it was inductive. And what we mean by inductive is that they looked at what was happening and they tried to explain that. So they weren't prescriptive. They weren't saying this is what should happen. They were based on what was already did. So they looked at what companies were already doing. They were observing them. And then they were trying to piece together, well, we can see this pattern happening in practice. Let us induce, i.e. the inductive approach, let us induce what we think this is explaining or what this theory. So if we see a load of companies accounting for income in this way, let's make a theory around that to see can we explain it. So that's what we call an inductive theory. And it finds following out what are the majority of people happening in practice and let this form your theory. So it, it looks for patterns and then it induces what the theory might be. So if we see a load of companies doing a particular accounting method in a particular way, we say that must be the way it's done. So they develop a theory around that then. 
right? So that's what an inductive theory is. It doesn't look at what it should be. It looks at what is actually happening in practice. So it assumes what's happening in practice is actually best practice. So that's the important thing is that's one of the criticisms. So if we see the majority of companies doing a particular thing, then we assume that's the most appropriate practice. But of course, if you remember in the banking crisis, just because the majority of the banks were doing accounting for loans in a particular way, doesn't mean that's the right way. So inductive theories, which focus on what is happening, they're, they've concentrated on the status quo, right? They can't, it's very hard to improve upon current practice because you're assuming current practice is the best that's there. So that's different than what deductive theories are would look at, whereas they are more looking at well, what's the best way to do this, not necessarily what is currently happening in practice. So from the 1960s, 1970s, there was a general acceptance, but maybe we mean, need to be more prescriptive. What they mean by that is they're looking to say what should be done, right? not driven by existing practice. And a lot of this was coming from the 60s and 70s were periods of high inflation, and they felt historical cost accounting wasn't really suitable for that. And we'll come across that next week and week after in accounting measurement. So a lot of uh, theorists and academics started to say, well, let's look at normative theories. Normative theories are looking to prescribe practices. They're saying this is what it should be. This is how we should value assets, not what is. Right? Inductive theories or descriptive theories, they go and say, well, what is everyone doing? And describe why they're doing that. Whereas the prescriptive or normative theory, they're saying, no, never mind what's happening. We're looking at we're, what the researcher believes should occur. This is the way assets should be valued. This is what should go into a profit and loss statement. And the key thing here, and this is an important one to watch when you're going, when you're looking at theories, is you cannot evaluate a normative theory based on accounting practice because it doesn't say it's trying to reflect accounting practice. These normative theories are seeing what they believe should be done. And just because that's not currently being done doesn't mean the theory is incorrect, right? So that's an important one to understand. So you could have a normative theory saying all assets should be valued at current market value. Just because all assets are currently at historical cost doesn't mean that theory is wrong. It just means that theory has not been implemented. So it's important to watch when you're assessing whether a theory is useful or not, it may not be correct to evaluate it based, does it reflect current accounting practice? Right, so one of, a couple of the criticisms of normative theories will be it's unscientific in a case that it's value judgment. It's based on the researcher's value of what should be there. Right, so you can't base it on what you see in practice because that's not the way normative theories are built. It does not produce generally accepted accounting theory. So many will say it's, it's unproductive, it's more academic, uh, and it can be of doubtful value. The reason for that is you can have a huge amount of normative theories because there's nothing stopping you saying, for example, you could have a normative theory, this is how we treat COVID-19. Right? No, there may be no scientific evidence, but it's still a theory. Now, how credible the theory is will be based on the assumptions and, and the, the logic to it. But the point is there's nothing stopping anyone coming up with theories. So you can have these theories uh, that may have not been no unproductive or even damaged uh, the value of profession because they have no grounding or, or, or rigor to them. So from 70s onwards then, they moved away from looking at just normative to saying, let's look at positive theories. Now, I noticed a lot of words went thrown here, but positive theories were empiricalism. What they meant by that is it's going to be data driven. They were looking at theories to explain and predict accounting practice. So there was a lot more data becoming available in the 70s and 80s. And they were trying to say, well, let's take this data and try and predict why things are happening. So let's look at what's happened in the past and predict which companies will use which accounting methods or which managers will use which accounting methods. And these were positive theories in a sense that they were trying to contribute to society, that they were trying to predict this is what will happen in these types of companies. Because if you can predict accurately, you can manage fraud, you can manage the misuse of accounting standards uh, much better. All right? So positive theories predict and explain. Normative theories are prescriptive. They tell you what it should be. So for positive theories, you begin with assumptions. And through this, what we call logical deduction, you enable predictions. And the key thing about positive theories, they can be tested against reality. 
because they are based on being able to predict. Normative theories are not based on what's currently happening. So it's not fair to say all normative theories should be, their, their value should be based on whether they, they explain current practice. They may not, because there may be a different idea of what's going on. Whereas a positive theory says, for example, we might be begin with the assumption all managers will try and increase profits to boost their bonuses. And your logical deduction here, so the assumption is all managers want a big bonus. Your logical deduction then to say, well, if all managers want big bonuses, and if bonuses are based on profits, managers will choose accounting methods to boost profits. So you can see the assumptions. The assumptions here are all managers want to have a, the maximum bonus. And then the logical deduction means, well, if the bonus, we're assuming the bonus is based on company profits, we can logically deduce uh, deduce that the managers will try and boost their profits. So they will choose accounting methods that will boost their profits. And you can test that against reality. You can go and look at companies and see where there is an accounting choice. Do the managers choose the accounting method that maximizes their profits? So you can actually figure out whether this theory stands up to the data or not. So that's something that's useful about positive theories. They can be um, tested. Right? But there are criticisms. It's based upon the rational economic person. So it ignores behavioral bias. It's all this, this neo, neoclassical approach where they want to maximize their wealth. That may not always be the case. It assumes shareholders are the most important. It doesn't challenge, unlike normative theories, it accepts things that they are. So remember, the normative theory will challenge and say, that's not the right way to value an asset. You should do it this way. Positive theories look at what's there and they merely see, try to predict. So they don't really change the whole thing overall. They're merely looking at explaining, predicting what's currently happening. So we went from 1920s, before that, there was nothing really. 1920s, 1960s, it was really about explaining. The 1970s or 60s was really around uh, prescriptive, changing the foundation, said, questioning everything and saying, that's not the way it should be done. It should be differently. And then 70s was about explaining. Uh, explaining and predicting. And finally, then you came to the 1980s to date, is back to more normative around a conceptual framework. All right, so what we're looking at conceptual framework is, well, what should accounting be about? What should assets be? What should liabilities be? And that's a, a document that's more like a, um, a normative document, because it's saying what accounting practice should be. And the reason we have a conceptual framework is, that allows to have more consistent standards then. Because if, if there's a one definition of an asset, if there's one definition of a liability, there's one definition of income, then every other subsequent international accounting standard, or as they're now known, international financial reporting standards, they will all follow that and be consistent. Because what you don't want is inconsistency throughout the standards. So in summary then, there is a huge, there is a variety of accounting theories. We're going to look at some of them about measurement next week. We're going to look at positive accounting theory after reading week. And we're going to look at accounting regulation theory as well. Some of the theories will be descriptive. Some of them will be prescriptive. Some of them will explain and predict. All right? But they all serve different purposes. So there's not this overarching one universal theory of accounting. All right? It'd be great if there was. But you can't get any agreement from everyone about what accounting should be. Uh, it's different things to different people and different variety in terms of the way people interpret it. Right? But it is important for an accounting theory. Um, but remember, they are only theories. Uh, the choice of one theory and preference another is a value judgment. Right? Some of the theories can be tested, the likes of positive theories. Others cannot be tested with data because they don't reflect reality currently. That's the nature of them. Right? But no more than the marketing theories you look at, the finance theories, the ethical theories, they are useful for understanding an area. They're useful for insight of what way they predict and explaining certain topics. So they're not perfect, but that's the nature of a theory, particularly when you're dealing with like the accounting, finance, economics. We are not what's known as hard sciences. We're not chemistry. We're not physics. We're not biology. We don't have hard and fast rules because, of course, we're dealing with people. So there's going to be that gray area. So when you're evaluating an accounting theory, there's three things you need to consider. Whether the argument supporting the theory is logical. Do you agree that managers 
will want to maximize their bonuses? And do you agree that managers will then try and maximize profit? If you agree with that, do you agree with the assumptions that that will then mean that managers will choose accounting methods to maximize the profit? And whether you see any supporting evidence. So do you agree with the argument, the overall logic? Do you agree with the central assumptions, maybe about human behavior? And then is there any evidence to support it? So that's the way you're trying to critique an accounting theory. And it's not always possible to get all three. You may not be able to get any supporting evidence. And we'll see that with some of the accounting measurement theories. There's no possible to get any supporting evidence because they're not currently in operation because these are prescribing how they think it should be done in the future. Same with, for example, some people might have a theory about how to prevent or cure COVID-19. You may not have any evidence because no one has tried it. So then you're based on one and two. Do you agree with the logic and the central assumptions? Because you may not have any evidence. So it can be tricky to debunk or to prove or disprove particular theories when there's no hard evidence available because no one has tried it. Um, and then to come to your conclusions, you can then be determined by deduction or induction. So for example, deduction is you start at the top and you work down to come to kind of what we come to conclusions or hypotheses. And that's kind of what we did with the manager's bonus. We started off with the high level principle that managers will want to maximize their bonus. We then deduce further, that means managers will want to maximize profit and therefore managers will choose accounting methods that increases profit. And there's our hypothesis. That is our testable rule. And you'll cover this in statistics as well, that managers who are paid bonuses based on profits will choose accounting methods to maximize the profits. And that is something we can go out and test. And we have deduced that through logic. Induction is the opposite. Induction goes out to the population. It goes out and looks at companies. It takes a sample of that data and then it makes inferences about the population. So, for example, you might go out and look at people who are sick and you see, right, there's a certain characteristic that makes this a more severe virus, a less severe virus. And you infer back then, we infer by induction that this is what we think COVID or what we think the flu or what we think a different disease is. And you test that then by trying uh, with a sample and control group. So deduction doesn't go out and look at the population first. It starts high level and works down. Induction goes out first and then it works back. But you're still, both of you are still coming back to testable rules. They're just coming out in two different ways. All right. So deduction starts with objectives, for example, financial statements, and then it derives or deduces down certain things that they can test. All right. So you go from a general guide to specific guides. That is a top-down approach. Whereas induction starts with observations and works back. So it tests generalizations. It goes from specific examples, for example, of ill patients or companies' financial statements, and it induces from what it sees to more general statements. For example, that this disease is going to be more severe in this type of patient, or this company is going to adopt this type of rule in this type of circumstance. So you look at the examples that you have and you induce what you see. So there's two different ways and a lot of research can be either or. Some research will be deductive and they'll go from high level theories down. Others will be more inductive. So it's not necessarily, it's not a binary outcome. They can be complement complementary each other and they're often used together. You can research it may work back from conclusions then to develop a hypothesis. So you can have this inductive and deductive approach. It's not always black or white. All right. So accounting theory, as I said, there's no single comprehensive theory because different approaches are used. Right. Some use inductive, some use deductive, some use descriptive theories, some use normative theories. So we don't have a universal theory of accounting. We have different theories for different aspects of it, but perhaps that's one limitation. It would be great if we had one because it would have a consistent guidance for accounting standards, it gives give us a frame of reference and there will be much more comparability because you have a lot more debates now currently, as we'll see in accounting measurement, debates around how assets should be measured, how income should be measured. And when you have that inconsistency in a profession, uh, it can lead to trouble. It can lead to problems uh, and we can see 
currently accounting has a lot of problems in terms of fraud scandals the purpose of financial statements does it cover enough does it cover too much and how the auditor is managing to audit them as well so it is a tricky balance to be had so overall your takeaway from week one i know it was quite a tricky one to start off with but as i said semester one is heavy on accounting theory and it's again it's half your module in terms of your uh, if you go by the title you do need to understand accounting theory Right. We want you as graduates of accounting and finance to be critical, that you can critically evaluate why do we measure assets this way? Why do certain companies adopt this accounting policy? Why do other companies not adopt it? Right. Why did a particular manager adopt that accounting policy? All right. So you critically question what's going on. We don't have a universally accepted theory of accounting, but we do have different theories. We're going to look at accounting measurement theories, positive accounting theories, and we're going to look at accounting regulation as well. Uh, and we're going to try and get you to think about how might I evaluate that theory? Is that a good or bad um, accounting theory? And you're going to have the same, is that a good or bad ethical theory? Is that a good or bad finance or corporate finance theory? And you're going to be going through these in each of your modules. Because remember, you have to have theory to try and understand an area. What is finance about? What is marketing? How do we explain people's behavior? And that comes to accounting as well. But accounting is much more than a technical take trial balance, prepare financial statements, and that's it. Right? There's people behind it. We make up the rules about what goes into our financial statements. We make up the rules of how we account for each line item in those financial statements. And those rules have to come from somewhere. And they have to have some logic. Because if there's no logic, then it's a meaningless profession and society wouldn't put the trust in it. So it is quite an important area and your continuous assessment is going to be very much focused on that as well. All right. So your follow-up work then for week one uh, is have a look at the first question pack that is now available. And if you want, it's not compulsory, but the Deegan and Unerman chapter one, which is the textbook that's outlined in your module overview, that'll be a useful one to supplement your reading around introduction to accounting theories. We'll follow up then in week two, where we will look at accounting measurement, and we'll start to look at specific accounting theories and see what they actually say, and how do they differ to the practice that we are used to from AF1, and maybe even back from Leaving Cert as well. So that was the finish of week one, AC220, Introduction to Accounting Theories.